Hey everyone, this is one of two films and two long articles that Rebel Wisdom is publishing on claims to do with the vaccines and the controversy centred on Brett Weinstein and Heather Hyang's Dark Horse podcast. This film is an interview with Iona Italia, the editor of Aereo magazine, which is publishing one of the articles where we talk about the background and the editorial process. I'll put the link to the article in the show notes below. Iona, welcome. Thank you. So we're talking today uh, because you're the editor of Aereo magazine. You've just published an article um, that I wrote about the whole situation recently to do with Brett Weinstein, the Dark Horse, ivermectin vaccines that we've been working on for quite a while. And the reason we're having this conversation is because this whole this whole scenario, like I've been really interested in like the, the, the sense making aspect of it. And it's really complex because it brings in so many things to do with friendships like Brett and Heather. We've hosted events with them in the past. I consider Brett a friend. It's a very difficult dynamic that I think a lot of us wrestle with in the alternative media landscape, especially if we're looking up, if we're searching for truth and balancing it with private relationships and public relationships. And like, this is one of the complicating factors that I saw very early on with when I was looking at the intellectual dark web, aligned incentives, friendships, all of this kind of um, real complicating facts. And we don't, none of us know how to deal with this. We're, we're outside the institutions. We're making it up as we go along. These are incredibly complicated topics. And I thought it might be useful to put out this interview at the same time as the piece so people can maybe see how we wrestle with these kind of topics all the different dynamics that come into play, the editorial decisions, all of these questions that come up that I know we both feel very keenly and we've been in discussion around. And I thought maybe let's shed a little, share a, a little bit of light on it. Um, so I'll start by asking you, what is Aereo magazine? Uh, so Aereo is an online digital publication, small independent publication, um, at the moment completely patron funded. Um, and I would say that it's Ario's main kind of um, thrust is we are an anti-woke leftist publication. So it's quite niche. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, there are many more of those people than, than one might think. Um, so we're, we are rather different from um, another heterodox publication. Um, to name another heterodox publication, we're rather different from Quillette because we are looking at our, our critique of, of um, social justice, leftism is very much a critique from the left or from within the left, leftist and centrist sphere. Um, and also we're focused more on arguments uh, and less on anecdotes of individual people's experiences. So um, yeah, that's Ario. As I mentioned before, like th these are incredibly difficult topics. Um, we're all wrestling with them. Um, I personally have tried to, to kind of act as ethically as I can. Like the article that's just been published, I sent it to Brett, or I sent a version of it to Brett about a week ago um, to, to get his opinion, to see, get his response. I've been in contact with Brett quite a bit behind the scenes. Um, this is something I haven't done lightly. Um, and I know that when we talked, also, you had an element of feeling conflicted as well. Um, is, is, that, is that fair? How would you, how would you uh, summarize kind of what, why did you decide to publish it? And what are the factors that you're kind of bearing in mind? I don't know Brett well, but he and Heather have been largely supportive towards Ario. So Heather is actually a patron. Um, when I say she's a patron, I don't mean she's a funder. I mean, she pays, I think it's uh, on the $10 or $15 a month um, patron, tier, pat patron tier in Patreon, which is fantastic. Um, we, we value all of our patrons. And she's also written several pieces for Ario. And I absolutely love her writing. And those pieces have been very well received and I've really enjoyed them. And we can't afford to pay writers very much at the moment. So uh, when people are writing for us, it's also, you know, it's a privilege and an honor to publish the writing of really good people. They're not in it for the filthy lucre. And um, we recently had a um, two-week free speech fortnight 
which was entirely dedicated to articles about free speech, which I'm currently reworking into an edited collection. It's going to come out as a book, hopefully the first book in an ARIO annual imprint. Um, but Heather, uh, Heather contributed one of the pieces to the free speech fortnight. And I, it was on, um, the importance of not silencing maverick voices in science was a really nice piece, but in, in the centre was this paragraph about um, the efficacy of ivermectin as a prophylactic against COVID um, and suggesting that people take ivermectin rather than getting vaccinated. So I, and I definitely don't agree with her on that view. I solicited responses to the piece and we have published um, two pieces that are both about um, a, a, both kind of debunkings of, of the ivermectin hypothesis, uh, but ni neither of them really address, neither of them are, are specifically about Brett and Heather, but they're both, um, they're both just general debunkings, uh, both explanations of why taking ivermectin instead of being vaccinated is not a good idea. Um, and I'm obviously not a microbiologist and I'm not an epidemiologist, so I don't, I can't say this with absolute certainty, but as far as I can tell from all the evidence, this line of thinking is just wrong. And I wouldn't like to see them silenced or, or, um, censored in some way, but I do feel a requirement to do some pushback. That seemed to be at the heart of your piece for me. How, to what degree is there kind of obligation to give pushback to this? And how can we give pushback without demonizing the people and cutting off all lines of communication between the two factions. So, um, and it, I wouldn't have published a hit piece on Brett and Heather because we don't publish hit pieces, full stop. For one thing, I don't have a team of lawyers. <laughs> also, um, I don't find it very helpful. Um, and we have an international audience, and I think a lot of people internationally have never heard of Brett or Heather and are not really interested in them, but they are going to be interested in the topic. So that's why I decided to publish the article. Um, I haven't met Brett and Heather. I don't know them well. Heather has always been um, friendly and su largely supportive um, to me and to Ario. And I have also been on the Black Horse podcast. Dark Horse. Dark Horse. Dark Horse podcast. I have been on the Dark Dark Horse podcast even. So about a month or two ago, I think. Um, and I talked about, I've written a book on Argentine tango called Our Tango World. And I talked to Brett about the Evo psych implications of partner dancing and the culture of partner dancing. So it was a completely unrelated subject. Yeah, I mean, I guess I have a closer relationship with with Brett and Heather, having done events with them in the past and um, interviewed them on several occasions. And I have to say this whole process has been one of the most difficult experiences I've had. Mm. And the most difficult part has been this sense of balancing my obligations to them as friends. Uh, and, and, and the wider obligations to truth seeking and to making sense of the landscape and then expressing what I believe to be true. And it's been, and there really aren't any rules to this. This is something I think completely new. When, when there are institutions, there were sort of institutional rules. And I still have some of those, like right of reply is quite a big one in, in journalism. If you're going to say something about someone, you should put their, put the points to them before publication. That's something that's largely lost, I think, in the independent landscape, where the idea is you put something out and then people can do a counterpoint if they want, their own vid video, and then it sort of becomes a back and forth, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the, the classical one is like, okay, you're putting out a piece of journalism now, so you get people's responses, so any claims or comments in that piece should have the counterpoint in it. You see a, you see a piece of journalism, it says, um, Da, 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 um, we say this, they say this. Right. We say, and there's a kind of both side. Like that, that process can become kind of performative and kind of both sidesy as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the navigating of that and what I what I have tried to do is to is to 
keep the contact and to, to basically let Brett know about the pieces that I was putting out. Um, largely, the this Aereo piece, as I said, I sent him quite a while ago um, to get his response to. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how to do better than that. Um, but it has been incredibly difficult to to balance that in this sense of, um, yeah, the, the, this sense of kind of split loyalties, but but also a very clear kind of ethical sense as I've looked into the claims, and alongside this article, I'm actually putting out a more detailed analysis of the claims that has been put together by our researcher, like where where I think they don't add up, where I think that some of them are actually very troubling to have put them out and then not corrected them I think and I, I know I'm coming in with a sort of may it with a with a set of um, assumptions that come from my work at um, places like the BBC and Channel 4 News and they may not be appropriate to this new media landscape but I do think there are certain ethical principles I think that in Brett and Heather's most recent podcast they said well we, we never told anyone what to do and it's true that they never told anyone what to do. They never instructed anyone what to do. But they have, like Brett took ivermectin live on air. He's said that it's something like 100% effective as a prophylactic, stopping you catching COVID. I am unvaccinated, but I am on prophylactic ivermectin. And the data actually, shocking as this will be to some people, the data suggests that prophylactic ivermectin is something like 100% effective at preventing people from contracting COVID when taken properly. Some of their guests have made really out, pretty outrageous claims that I don't think stack up in any meaningful way about the spike protein concentrates in the ovaries, which is false. Um, fertility concerns, which I haven't seen any evidence for. Certainly what well, the evidence presented during the podcast was, doesn't stand up. Um, maybe there's a steel man case for that. I haven't seen it. But I think when you're broadcasting and you're broadcasting to people who like a lot of people watching will have been vaccinated. Some some won't, but some will. And then a woman who's been vaccinated, it, it, like this is going to cause a huge amount of distress. Like you have to take on that responsibility, I think. Like that for me is an ethic. I, I don't think that's a holdover of a kind of old legacy media way of doing things. I think that's kind of basic ethics mm -hmm. for me. And that's the concern that I've seen over time is some of the some of the claims are extremely consequential and they're extremely uh, important. Obviously, Brett's perspective is they're important one way or the other. He feels like people are saying, well, you're you're risking lives because how dare you say these things? And he, I think, rightly says, well, if I'm right, then lives are being risked on the other side. So let's not, let's not kind of just use that one way. And I think he's right about that. Mm -hmm. But I think there has to be a real moral imperative if you're going to put out those claims, if you're going to make, if you're going to allow your guests to make those claims and then put that out, I think there's a moral imperative for you to look into them really carefully and to let go of any of the kind of, and that, that is not something I'm seeing happen, both publicly and privately, um, which is why I'm putting this article out and why I'm, yeah, why, why I'm so deeply concerned about it. And I'll also say there may be, there may be a, like I say, that I haven't made up my mind on, like ivermectin you mentioned before, I, I think there's some, there's some signal there, there's an argument over how strong that signal is. Um, I think the, the argument that it works as a prophylactic is a much more consequential one than saying it works as a treatment. Like if, the, you can argue over the, the quality of the data, but if I got COVID tomorrow, would I want to have some ivermectin? Maybe, uh, um, quite possibly. Like it, there's some evidence that it works, but telling people it's kind of nearly 100% effective in stopping you getting COVID based on one, that particular 100% claim is based on one study. And that study is very, very shady. Like there's been a lot of, um, it, it's now been kind of uncovered that there's a lot of things about that study that are very, um, don't really add up. Like the data looks manipulated or imp well, impossible values in the data, mm -hmm. um, and that is that's that's really troubling for me. Like I, I think we don't have a code of ethics in the alternative media space to cover this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
But if you're not talking to anyone who disagrees with you, which I'm not seeing Brett doing, this is, I, I, I can't keep quiet about that and not speak out. Like that's real, and that's, it's about the sense making. It's about the sense making. It's also, as you know from the article, it's about how I don't, I, and I want to say again, like I, I'm, I believe both Brett and Heather to be very ethical actors. But I also think we're in an information landscape where things get warped around us, we, we, where echo chambers get created, where you get audiences that want a certain thing. And we all can lose our ground. We can all lose our footing in this environment. We get kind of audience capture. We get all, all of these things start to happen. And I think we need to build some system to deal with that as well. The counterpoint is, and I've seen this made, is like, no, there's no responsibility. People are adults. They can make up their own minds on whatever comes out. You're basically, you're basically trying to gatekeep. You're basically bringing all of this old gatekeeper morality into the alternative space and it's not needed. People can make up their own minds, stop mollycoddling them. Well, I don't think that you or I are the gatekeepers of, of anything. Um, I, I'm, I am certainly against, for example, um, I'm certainly against big tech moguls deciding whose speech gets to be heard and whose speech does not get to be heard. So, for example, I think that social media should be a completely free speech platform. Um, and it is up to the responsibility of the user to mute and block and go private and do whatever they, they wish to not hear opinions they don't want to hear. But everybody's opinion should be permitted there, with the exception of, um, speech that is, um, speech that is, is used not to express opinions, but specifically to commit crime, like uh, fraud, plagiarism, um, child pornography, things like that, where it's not the fact that the person said something that is the problem. It is that they, it is that they were breaking the law in, in another way. Um, so with, with that proviso, I am really a free speech absolutist. I don't trust, um, Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or, um, whoever the, people at YouTube are, I said, and I definitely don't trust the algorithm to decide for me what I should be permitted to potentially read um, and watch and listen to. And I think people are less malleable than we think, um, or rather they are influenceable, but in much more complex ways than just if they watch this video, they will end up inevitably changing their minds. However, um, of course, every indivi as individuals, and especially as people who have small platforms, or mine is small, yours is bigger, um, we should, we have a responsibility to not put out information that we think is false, uh, especially if it has consequences, depending on how, how kind of widespread the claims were. If it was just some small crank somewhere, then there is always the danger if the person is quite obscure that in in disagreeing you're actually signal boosting the original view. Um, people are very perverse, so if they see you disagreeing, that might make them agree, um, and it will certainly draw their attention. However, um, Brett and Heather have a large platform, um, have a larger platform than me. I'm not. I'm not giving a platform to them in any way. Yeah, I think you've put your finger on something that I think a lot of people miss because the conversation online seems to devolve almost entirely and always into free speech versus censorship. And I'd agree with you that the, the old, like the big tech platforms now are in the kind of worst of all worlds. They're trying to play the old gatekeeping game that the mainstream media used to play in an even more, even less transparent way in an ad hoc way, in a kind of random way, and it's just, it's it's ridiculous, it's unsustainable. It's like, there's not even any kind of consistent editorial standards, like, it's it's just pretty outrageous. But I think the key thing that people don't really think about is, most of it is about the individual moral decisions, or ethical decisions of people who are putting out content. Mm -hmm. It's not really so much, that's where the, that's where 
in a decentralized environment, that's where all of the important decisions are made. And you can then get, you can very easily get a kind of race to the bottom. Because if you don't put this person on, someone else might put this person on. If you don't challenge this person, someone else. Like there's all of these dynamics that come in. Um, and I had a really interesting conversation with the guys from Trigonometry mm. about their interview with um, Sutra at Bhakti, who argued, I think they used a clip, I, of course I won't get vaccinated, I'm not mad to, to advertise it. And he was making a, a, a vaccine, a kind of an anti-vaccine case before, and they, they said, look, this was before vaccines had, had been, um, there weren't any vaccines at that point for, for COVID. So it was a different context, but that interview raced to about a million views. And we had a really interesting back and forth because they're not qualified to assess his claims. I'm not qualified to assess his claims. As hosts, we're not equipped to make those judgments. So I asked them, do you feel that you have an obligation then to host someone making a counter argument? I would feel some sense of moral obligation yes. in that situation to do that, mm. is what I'm, what I'm saying. And I'm wondering if those are things that you wrestle with. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very, very good question. The reality is, is that when we released it, I, we got pushed back, I got pushed back from my friends. So the difficulty is, do I believe that he has the right to say that? I do. Now, when it comes to the point of responsibility is, and where we are, do I feel that we should actually, and I'm, I'm talking myself through because this is something that I'm really, I've, I've wrestled with. Do I feel that we have an obligation to point, to put the other side to it? I would say, I would say I think we do actually. And it was a really interesting conversation because Francis kind of really thought about it and said, yes, I think we do. And that was, it was great because you could, you could see his kind of wrestling with it in, in real time. And that, um, I think we have to look for curators who are clearly doing that wrestling, who are clearly wrestling with their obligations and are clearly making, um, who are not sure because there's no hard and fast, there's no certainties. There, we're all making judgments on who is a relevant person. Editorial judgment is um, even sort of working in a, in a newsroom for, for a good sort of 15 years. Editorial judgment is always contextual. There are some guidelines, there are some general rules, but there are always exceptions. Like if the story is so important, you can break some of those rules. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I also want to say, because there's so many people who have a kind of, like the media generally gets such a sort of bad rap and many, many people, especially on YouTube, are kind of anti-media. My experience, and this is in the UK, I think the UK has a healthier media culture than the US anyway, more generally pretty much every journalist I worked with had a real sense of kind of ethical, like those were the conversations that you always had. Like we, I worked on the foreign desk for a long time. Like the, the concerns about the safety of people who were gathering the news, the safety of the local staff, like will this put someone in danger? Like they, they take those things incredibly seriously. And there are like, that's, it's something that I don't think people realize unless they worked within these environments. And there are of course, there are, of course, really crappy journalists. There are, of course, journalists who are, um, in any in every way, there are systematic corruptions on the on the industry as well. But there are also deep, um, yeah, there are people with with a deep moral sense and a deep kind of moral obligation and feeling of kind of like wanting wanting to do good um, and weighing up all of these different kind of factors. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily appreciate. I think that. Um so when it comes to social media generally, and I, I'll include, I include YouTube in that, I think of that as being the de facto public square nowadays. Um, so for me, I don't want to see curation going on uh, on social media uh, any more than I would like um, the telephone company to decide who can and can't use the phone. Um, it's very different if you have um, a specific publication or YouTube channel or podcast yourself, then you inevitably make selections about what you're going to publish and who you're going to talk to. And I think it's actually um, 
um, I think everybody should be allowed to make whatever selections they wish. But I feel that where I want to put my own time and attention is to signal boost things that I think are more important and to talk to people who I think it's important to talk to. Um, so, for example, to to give one example, I have a lot of people, um, not a lot, but I have some people asking me to interview Charles Murray on the podcast or to publish things about race and IQ linkages in ARIO. And the reason that I don't do that is not because I think people should not be allowed to investigate that topic or... Um, I mean, I think when you're investigating a topic, it's it's really hard to anticipate what kinds of results may come from the investigation. It's always useful to just know the truth. Um, it's it's fine to just want to know the facts. It's actually fine to be just asking questions, although that's become sort of demonized. Who knows for, for what purposes it will be relevant in the future, and it could be relevant for all kinds of good purposes. For example, we could discover a way to use CRISPR or some other gene editing technology to boost everybody's IQ. Um, but I I don't personally feel that it's um, really um, focusing on that topic forwards the discussion in the direction that I want and in and it's not something I'm interested in. So I don't feel that just because I think uh, Murray should be allowed to publish his books, kind of and not un unmolested in the sense, not personally molested, with just normal critical pushback. Um, I also, that doesn't mean that I therefore must um, interview Murray. And that's, I get a lot of people who seem to not understand that distinction. Yeah. And Something I'd like to talk about is bias, because obviously we all have, we're all biased by definition. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're biased creatures, we're, we're imperfect creatures. Um, I think as much as possible, journalism should be, as a form of truth seeking, mm -hmm. should be about trying to put that aside as much as possible. Um, the interesting thing is that the rise of the alternative media, I think, has shown up that the the kind of affectation of objectivity of the mainstream was that it was it was an affectation. It was a kind of it was a worldview. It was a low resolution narrative that the alternative has kind of been like. Ah, oh, actually, that's that's a thing. It's it's not it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. It's a thing, and there's there's all these games that are played to kind of pretend that it is the truth. Um, and I but I think on the flip side, in the alternative space, you've got a complete collapse of that. So I take. For example, Sam Harris, who I, I, I really enjoy a lot of his stuff, his recent podcast about Brett's content from the beginning was kind of an opinion piece. It was sort of, it's half news, it's half opinion. It's all kind of melded together. Um, and what I've tried to do over the last couple of weeks, like I put out a film about Ivermectin that tried to show both sides of the story. Because one of my, my concerns, like, we're seeing a complete fragmentation of narratives. No one is... No one is trying to hold the center and to sort of put people who are skeptical, people who are pro, and put, put them into the same film. They weren't, they weren't kind of in dialogue with each other, which I think a lot of people would like to see and I'd be interested to host at some point. Um, but that was sort of me trying to put as best as I can my, my biases aside. Of course, I have some biases, I have some opinions. I'm kind of putting them out there with this article now as in as measured way as I can. Um, but I think people maybe struggle with that, especially in this in this sort of new landscape that it's possible to do both, or it's possible to have both, that it doesn't bias. And I think the only way is to kind of reflect on our biases, maybe to talk about them and to kind of bring them up um, and make them part of the conversation. Because otherwise, like this, this pretense at objective truth, and also to maybe say, look, all of this is, well, is provisional. I'm saying this now, I'm putting out this document now. It's what I think right now. It's not a definitive statement because that may change. Like there needs to be some sort of sense that this is an ongoing process as well. Um, well, I think that there is, there is a danger in um, platforming views that don't really have any, any substance behind them because it implies a kind of 
um, it, it, it implies a kind of legitimacy, and this is something that mainstream media often do. In many cases, I, I don't find that justified at all. Um, I think that some views are so unlikely to be true that it's not necessary to give them any airtime, and even by, rebut, um, by offering a rebuttal, it suggests that there's, there, there's something there to rebut. It's not that I think that mainstream medical authorities are at all infallible. However, that doesn't mean that there are no standards of evidence, anything goes, and um, a quirky idea is just as likely to be true. Yeah, there's a couple of things that come up. One, I think you're right, like the, the decision to have on certain people, to signal boost certain certain people, is, is, is a kind of ethical one in itself, like, which, which, is, which can be complex. For example, I would not have chosen to interview the people who Brett has interviewed. Um, Geert van den Bosch, um, Robert Malone, Steve Kirsch. I wouldn't have chosen to interview them, certainly not kind of one-on-one. -on -one. I'd be maybe, but that that changes, that judgment changes once they have a certain profile, once they have a certain, um, yeah, once they have a certain public profile, because I think there is then an editorial justification for at least having them in a dialogue with someone or a debate with someone. Um, yes. But the mainstream would probably shy away from that because they would say, well, that's giving false equivalence. That whole gatekeeping game doesn't work anymore. Like, because oh, because they're they're out, they're out there. These people are out there, and um, yeah, I don't find many of their claims particularly convincing. Uh, particularly someone like Steve Kirsch. I think if you read his document and you read the kind of deconstructions of it, you just think, how on earth could anyone think that this guy is a credible source? Um, but but I think that's that's the interesting thing is that editorial is. Editorial judgments are always contextual, and I think it's something that people don't quite appreciate. It's like, why are you making this decision over this decision? It's like you're you're constantly evaluating, and you're constantly a good newsroom or a good a working um, news organization is always a conversation. It's an ongoing conversation between different perspectives and different ideas and different judgments, and those judgments are always based on um, multiple kind of intersecting factors. The whole reason for covering this area, like I would not have gone anywhere near this topic if it had not been for Brett's decision to do that, my overlap with the Dark Horse audience, mm -hmm. the sense of this is now, these claims, these, this, that's the thing, Brett, a lot of these people were already out there in various, I was aware of Geert van den Bosch long before Brett had him on his podcast, he was on Dell Big Tree. I was aware of a lot of the Especially in May last year, there was a whole series of like medical grifters who turned up when I was covering the London Real story. Brian Rose, London Real, he launched this digital freedom platform, which was a massive scam after YouTube took down his interview with David Icke. Um, it was a weaponization of the free speech argument that made me really upset, really angry, because I think that's a sacred value, which is why I kind of went after him so hard. And it also flagged up some of these bigger issues. Um, and, he, and he basically kind of walked off with the money. Um, and, and it made me really fucking angry that he did this. But also, I was, I was aware of a lot of these figures back then, a lot of the sort of people who'd been kind of touting their chelation therapy or their kind of um, anti-vaccine or whatever their particular thing was. And there are, whether or not there is signal there, there's a whole ecosystem. Like there are there are conferences dedicated to anti-vaccine movements. There are whole incentive structures on that side, and that's part of the problem that I have with people who are skeptical of the mainstream narrative but credulous of the other narrative. It's like, look, there are incentive structures on both sides if you look carefully course, and yes. keep keep skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, so I was aware of all these people. I was aware of these arguments. I was aware of these figures, um, and so yeah, I guess that's the the, the key for me is. And I say this in the article, it's like that last 10%. Like I agree with Brett and Heather on so many of the pieces, they, the points they make about kind of institutional capture and the warping factors of big pharma and all of these sort of issues. Yes. And ironically, I think most medical figures I know also, like this is not forbidden knowledge. Like this is actually quite, quite kind of well known. Um, most medical figures I know know that, like they know the corrupting effects of big pharma. This is not something unusual that that um, 
hasn't been factored in by an awful lot of people. And so this, this sense of it's the last 10%. It's not about the 90% of the warping factors. It's the last 10% of does the spike protein concentrate in your ovaries? Does Is ivermectin 100% effective as a prophylactic? Or can we say with confidence it's 100% effective as a prophylactic? The answer to those questions is no. Um, and that then there's a, there are consequences for everybody of saying that they're true. Yeah. Yes, the answers to those questions are independent of how much faith you have in the WHO or whether people did U-turns on masks or whether they were hypocritical in not condemning the Black Lives Matter protests but con condemning anti-masking protests. Um, all of those questions about the terms of the debate and... Um, people's personal political views and motivations are irrelevant to these questions. Yeah. These, these questions can be investigated and the evidence, the evidence for Brett and Heather's views on this seems to me to be very thin. So you talk about the incentives on both sides. There are incentives in the independent sphere as well. Um, I think that that's one of the, one of kind of two reasons why the IDW release imploded. One was that it's actually, in some ways, it's easier to um, voice heterodox thoughts if you have a kind of solid salary behind you, um, if you're a tenured professor, or um, if you have a um, if you have some other job that's, let's say, of course, not affected by your opinions, um, and you don't. You, you therefore don't have to, you're not watching your Patreon count with anxiety from month to month, hoping that enough people will agree with you to bring you in money. That is potentially a distorting, that is potentially a distorting factor. So there's that kind of audience capture thing. And of course, also, if you become very popular, you have a large audience nodding along with everything you say, then you can really quickly turn into Dave Rubin. Um, and, I can tell with Dave Rubin and a few other people who I, pro I won't, probably won't name here um, that they have really lost their ability to do critical thinking. And I can tell that from the way in which they characterize the views with which they disagree. And I'm very strongly opposed to the whole woke thing. I'm very much not woke um, or uh, maybe even post-woke, but I was never woke to begin with. I just... I, I don't like identity politics, not a fan of the, the um, social justice leftist ideology. However, um, it doesn't help when I see people who agree with me in their opposition to that just ridiculously caricaturing it. Um, and I see this in the, on the right as well, saying things like, um, you know, liberals just... They, they hate freedom and ridiculous things like that that suggest that the person has, has not seriously taken on board the views of their opponents and has n never considered that those other people might also be intelligent. They might also have thought about these things. They might also have come to their conclusions, even if they're erroneous, through some just more sophisticated process of thinking. And that's a real sign of being in an echo chamber, I think, and never getting proper pushback. Um, and it's one reason why I think it's extremely important to keep lines of communication open um, across those divides. Mm. The other thing that is kind of inevitably corrupting is um, trying to mix friendship and politics. And we all know this from, from normal private life. Of course, I have friends with whom I can have very differing political opinions and we can discuss things. Um, as long as it's not, that's not the main focus of our friendship. Um, but I would say that that's quite unusual. Mostly, if I, if I know that I disagree with a friend on something, then I just steer clear of that topic. Um, and that's a very, very natural and deep-seated instinct, and friendships are really important. And so therefore, when you say, we're going to take a group of people, and we're all going to be good friends, 
um, good friends and also we're going to be signal boosting each other. So in fact, uh, in fact, our financial well-being is also invested in us remaining friends. And then we're going to be able to openly and frankly and firmly disagree about things that are important to us. That just doesn't work and it didn't work right, right from the beginning. Um, I think the closest it came to working was uh, the early debates between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Um, that was the closest it came, but then quickly it became, um, we'll disagree on these things that are peripheral to what we think is important. And we might disagree very strongly on those things, you know, but that's not really the important stuff. On all the important stuff, we're in lockstep. You're talking about the IDW. I do, I'm yeah, talking about the sure. IDW now. Yes. And I think that that's, I'm not blaming the IDW particularly for that. I just think that that is a natural feature of being a sociable ape species. Mm. Um, alliances are really important. But uh, um, it they do also lead to conscious or unconscious self-censorship and, and a shutting down of kind of the dialogue. Yeah, Jay Shapiro wrote a great piece about this that maybe I'll tag in the comments below where he made the point there's another dark conversation that everyone who follows the IDW is aware of, which is the warping factors, the reason that this person might be saying this, or like, and that was never part of the conversation. Like there was a there was a dark conversation that was never voiced. Like the um, and he said he said he had a great piece about just because you've overcome bad philosophy doesn't mean you've overcome bad psychology. And we are all subject to that, especially if you start getting popular, if you start getting public attention, which all of the members of the IDW did. And I think that story is is absolutely fascinating. Like the, the trajectory of the IDW as a kind of alternative sense-making network is one of the great stories of our time, I think. And it's, it's something I'd like, yeah. to, I'd like to write about at, at length. It's a lovely idea. Um, I just don't think it's workable in practice. The idea being we can model how people can remain friends while still disagreeing strongly on certain topics, but it just didn't, it just didn't work. And I think it was always kind of bound to failure. I, I guess the cautionary, the person who I particularly see as a cautionary tale, um, and I'm sure we'll get lots of attacks for, for naming this person, but I will go ahead and name him. Um, James Lindsay is for me the example of what happens when you just get um, too uh, captured by the battle, really. Um, and it began as critique and ended in sort of demonization of everybody who disagrees. Yeah. yeah. Beware in fighting monsters that you do not become a monster. Mm -hmm. And also the issue with that is the incentive landscape of, of the of the platforms we're using, like James Lindsay plays the Internet of Beefs game to perfection. Mm -hmm. um, if people haven't what, read it, it's a perfect piece about how it's a very it's a very useful strategy. You basically frame anyone who attacks you as bad faith. You build up an army of people who support you, and it it, it attracts followers. Um, he keeps mentioning his follower count, like it clearly me means a lot to him. It's almost like a computer game to see how much popularity you can get. Like, uh, yeah, I've been. Critical of James Lindsay quite a few times. Um, I did an interview with him where I put some fairly mild criticism to him. Um, we had a bit of a falling out. Um, also, same thing happened with Dave Rubin, um, which is is one of the the problems of of being a trying to do actual journalism in this space because yeah, you risk contact. You risk there's reasons why people don't 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 do it. Um, mm. I, I know the interview with Dave Rubin cost me quite a lot of opportunities with 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 people that and contacts with people that I that I value. But yes. I thought it was a it was a very justified piece to do. They were they were valid questions, and um, yeah, I'm still proud of that interview. And I don't actually, I generally don't subscribe to the view that uh, any of the people um, concerned are grifters. Um, you know, I think it's just the natural uh, sort of effects of um, 
the, the amplificatory effects of being in the echo chamber. And also people love the idea of having their champion. It's like on Game of Thrones. They want their, their pugilist out there in the ring. Um, and they feel very satisfied to see that happening. Um, and, uh, if you're the person, then you're going to get beaten up. <laughs> so. Yeah. There's one other thing I wanted to say because obviously we made, um, quite a few films about Jordan Peterson. We've, we've kind of been largely kind of, I guess, in the, the woke critical camp as well. I think we've, 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 there's a substantial shift in my opinion since 2018 to now. Mm. Like, I think we were quite ahead of the game in, ab in the circles that I'm part of at pointing to some of these factors. I think Jordan Peterson, uh, as a friend of mine said, broke a conversational seal. And that's what, that was part of the Peterson phenomenon was like he was some saying things in, in public and with science and evidence and that, that kind of said, oh, you can't say that anymore. And I think a lot of the attacks on him and the one man lightning rod of the culture war was based on that. Um, but I really think we're in a different position now. What we need is more is synthesis. Like he was antithesis. We had kind of, and, and now we're in a space where like that's why Rebel Wisdom is very much, we, we talk about integral theory a lot. The idea of integral theory, there are, different, there are different value modes on stream at any one time. Each of them has a piece of the truth. And how do we find a synthesis that can, can, can bring them together? Can, you can understand that, every, and Jonathan Haidt's work works very well on that as well. Like we have different temperamental types and we're good at different things. Um, I, yes, I, I, I disagree with, I mean, I think I've really come to disagree with Haidt's moral mm. foundations theory though. Okay. Um, I, it, it's a very temptingly neat and lovely theory. And I like a lot of Haidt's other work and I love Haidt himself. He's a wonderful guy. Um, but the idea that, uh, uh, liberals and conservatives fundamentally have different temperaments. I'm, I'm, un having seen how things have developed, um, I'm, over the past few years, I'm really unconvinced by that. Mm. Um, increasingly unconvinced by that idea. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I wanted to say, just because I think um, that people don't quite get it, it's still a part, a part about the warping factor of these platforms. Like, we've obviously built a platform around certain um, films, uh, coverage of certain figures, interviews with certain figures, and with that comes, you, you build, and this is part of my, my critique of, of, of Brett and Heather is that you build a new ecosystem. You may start off by being the heterodox or the counterpoint, but you build an ecosystem around that. That's the new consensus. Mm -hmm. And so I get, you see a lot in the comments, like oh, rebel wisdom, you might as well call it conventional wisdom. It's like, the point is that we're trying, like we're willing to challenge our own audience. Mm -hmm. Like, and pe people on the right are just as liable to get triggered as people on the left. Like oh, yeah. the the this is the the thing I find quite amusing is sort of like uh, snowflakes everywhere. It's like yeah, I mean like you, um, and that that always kind of amuses me when you see people kind of losing their shit in the comments, and you're just like yeah, well you're you're just hijacked. You're mm -hmm. hijacked by um, things that you're not even aware of, and then projecting it all onto everyone else. Oh, you're there, the snowflakes over there. It's like no, no, we we need. We need to become much more self-aware of our own biases, of our own kind of how we get captured, how we get taken over, because um, that is the only way. Like that's what Rebel Wisdom is about, is how do you become aware of those? How do you start overcoming them? How do you get to better sense making? And which means exposing yourself to things you disagree with, because if you can't do that, then there's plenty of other YouTube channels that will just tell you stuff that you agree with. Go and watch those. It's also, um, you know, the, the kind of totalizing the effects of the culture war on, um, on kind of people who are trying to disseminate knowledge have been very, have been very bad. Um, so one reason why, um, many people are seduced by, um, anti-vax stuff, for example, is because so many medical institutions and, um, so many big kind of institutions like the ACLU mm. who had a specific remit have instead just you know, pinned their colors to the mast of the culture wars. Yeah. 
and everything else has taken a backseat to the culture wars. And I think I see this really clearly in the trans in the trans debate. Um, it's uh, you know we are a um, we can't be, for example, I don't know, women's health center anymore because that would be anti-trans. And the culture war dictates we're on the woke side, and so therefore we are pro-trans rights, and and that must now be our thing, even though we had an original, perfectly reasonable. Um, remit and aim um, and goal. And I I saw that with many of the medical professionals, that suddenly it's everything must be about racism and fighting racism. And I just think, no, your thing should be providing medical information. Okay, as a private individual, um, you should you should be interested in whatever you like. You can tweet about hedgehogs all day if, if you want. Um, Helen Pluckrose does have a friend who whose main thing is hedgehog welfare. Um, but if your institution is a medical institution and you are willing to kind of sacrifice um, frankness and good information for the sake of being a good culture warrior, I find that really troubling. Um, and that's part of the mess that we've got in. Iona. Thank you very much. Was there anything that we didn't mention that you wanted to mention? I don't think so. Um, please read, Ario. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>